Welcome to another episode of the New Tech People podcast. On today's episode, we've got Brett Thomas, Director and COO of The Melt. Welcome, Brett. Thanks for having me, John. Mate, the melts are gaining a little bit of notoriety up in Newcastle. A little bit uh, more positive stories coming out of you know the journey to date, um, which is really interesting. Kind of dig into that today. But um, for those of you, our audience that don't know either, well, let's start with your background first, um, your individual background, and then we'll go the slingshot journey into the melt. So, mate, what was your background? How did we get to where you're at today? It's an interesting story. Um, not sure that we'd have long enough. Actually, I'm yeah. one of those people that's probably had the seven careers that. You know that that's becoming sort of more, more and more um, opportunistic. These yeah, but days. I, that that's an interesting point, though. Even just to start with, like I really like that. It's a lot of you know junior people coming into technology in general. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you think you might have to do a degree and have a perfect career path set out, and quite often that's not the case. You're in a COO role right now, dealing with a or working with a lot of technology companies, and I'm sure you're dealing with seasoned professionals as well as junior burgers that are just starting out in their career, but. Mate, to get a, a path is very rarely how you set it out 10 years in advance, right? Yeah, that's, that's very true. So I, I, I actually started um, trying to be a professional soccer player right. a long, long time ago. Yeah. Um, if I'm totally honest, I wasn't probably good enough. I play for New South Wales and in the Australian University team. But, um, but the point is that I broke my leg and that kind of just polarised the decision about you know, forgetting about this thing and, and actually concentrating on my chosen career path, which was really to be a surveyor. Yeah. Um, I know I'm a long way from that, aren't I? Yeah, mate. I, I, yeah, I yeah. can join these dots. So, uh, so I, I spent um, the best part of a year when I broke my leg and it, it, you know, it had recovered to a point. I wrote a list of the 50 places that I wanted to sort of go to around the world and then went and visited them. Wow. So uh, backpacked for a year um, through Asia, uh, all of Western Europe, North and South America, and um, and had a had an absolutely amazing time. Got a bit of the travel bug though, and so when I did come back, I then started looking for roles in surveying that would really sort of put me out of my comfort zone. I worked in London while I was there for for a good few months uh, on some really big surveying projects um, like the Opera House and the Queen's House and I set out a house for the Sultan of Brunei and did a whole bunch of really cool stuff and um, and then came back came back to Australia and and like I said that sort of the travel bug was was still alive and well so I I took a job laying a, a gas pipeline out in west central western New South Wales and um, and that sort of then led into this remote working kind of idea, yeah. Where I could, you know, use the the education and the qualification that I had to pretty much go anywhere and do anything, uh, and and that was the amazing thing about about that particular degree. And I'm so so I'm really forever grateful for, for the opportunities that it's presented me. Um, I'm not surveying anymore, but but that led into a job with an offshore hydrographic surveying company so we were positioning oil rigs and platforms laying gas and oil pipelines bringing the ore ashore and then i spent five years laying optic fiber cables when the internet was kicking off uh, in the late 90s to 2003 yeah so worked in about 40 countries globally i only did one job in the southern hemisphere which was the southern cross cable the main cable that comes in to sydney yeah and um yeah, but but had had an amazing time. Saw things that you know make your head spin, and um, and it was and it was incredible. And so after five years, I kind of set set that plan in my in my mind that five years floating around a steel box in the ocean was probably going to be enough. Yeah. Um, you know, it would send you stir crazy or or turn you into somebody probably that would be an eternal gypsy. Yeah. And so I decided that I probably shouldn't do that. And um, and got a job actually working with my current business partner, Trent Bagnall, uh, one of. And um, and that was with a mining supply chain software company called QMaster, which is a which is one of the original new e tech Success innovation yeah. companies. Yeah. So, you know, we grew that from, I think I was the the fifth employee we grew that to about 110 or 20 offices in five countries it was public listed yeah and so you know we built this 
this business that was really, um, yeah, so different to, to what kind of any of us imagined that we were going to be working in. Trent was, was a, uh, environmental scientist, you know, and, um, and I was a surveyor and here we were in these, in this tech business selling software to the world's biggest mining companies all over the planet yeah and and you know off traveling around consulting and and exploring their supply chains and working out how our productized software solution could replace their spreadsheets and and make their operations run far more effectively than than otherwise they would so did that and uh and we got acquired a couple of times uh th throughout 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 time Trent, um, as the MD of a public listed company, the second time we, we got acquired, um, sorry, the first time we got acquired was a hostile takeover. We'd sold our, our software products into the US and a company in the US got pretty cranky about that. And so they approached our sort of majority shareholders, made them an offer and, and then essentially delisted us yeah, right. and made us private. And so Trent had to move on, obviously, He's, you know, he was the MD of a publicly listed company, but he went off then and, and, and went to Silicon Valley for a few months and sort of watched what was happening there in the innovation space and then came back with this con concept of corporate accelerator programs and then started Slingshot. So Slingshot Accelerator, another sort of pioneering New Newcastle business. hundred percent. In, in, in the innovation and space. And it's led to a lot of success stories out in Newcastle for sure. Oh, it certainly has. Yeah, we we um, we've been really fortunate to be able to unearth some amazing talent, not just here in the Hunter, but sort of you know across across Australia. We ran programs and about thirty five programs for a lot of the tier one Australian companies. Yeah. And just to provide context for those that of our audience that don't know Slingshot, you, you'd work with a, a big corporate partner who wanted to create some innovation, maybe it had some struggles internally on how do we create innovation internally? So you'd work with Slingshot, Slingshot would put together a program, take on board a bunch of startup companies who had ideas and products around solving a problem that would positively affect the corporate. That, that overview? Yeah, thing. no, that's pretty good, James, yeah. Um, there was a number of facets to why they were interested in, in working with Slingshot. Um, a lot of those companies, so, you know, we're talking about companies like Qantas, Lion, HCF, Caltex, NRMA, News Corp, you know, so big tier one Australian brands. And they quite often had large innovation teams. Qantas had about 35. Yeah, right. But they only know what they know and, and they don't sort of know what's coming and so they, they were interested from a disruption point of view as yeah, well nice. as increasing their opportunity to raise alternate revenue streams that, that fit with their core themes so this looking for disruption thing was really important to them obviously because they want to head off you know and be at the forefront of their competitive leadership and and maintain their competitive advantage so finding what the next level of entrepreneurs are working on in their garages and you know, and could potentially disrupt the way that they do business was important to them. But also, Qantas has 15 million frequent flyer members. So they're a membership loyalty rewards company, really. In fact, they don't really like flying people around because it's the most risky and costly part of what they do. Yeah, They probably make more money doing all the other stuff, actually, than they do flying people around. And so their themes were really sort of based around not just the air tourism, hospitality, but around loyalty membership and other things as well. Yeah. So what Slingshot would do would be would work with the corporate teams and determine what the themes were, and then we would go to market with those themes, appeal to the masses when it comes to the startups and scale-ups working on those themes, proposing solutions back, you know, and, and for Qantas, as an example, we'd have 500 applications. And then we'd whittle that down to maybe 50 and then you'd have, you know, 20 pitch and then you'd pick 10. And it was with the, you know, with the corporate executive teams, not, not the minions. Yeah. Because, you know, Alan Joy sitting in the front row and, and his five top, top, you know, um, corporate executive sort yeah. of team members. And then, you know, you would go into this like mini MBA three month where we would bring in the best mentors, coaches, um, and, and we would use our internal staff. We had quite a big team and we would just 
essentially coach these these startup founders and um, and scaling businesses to be able to do business with Qantas um, and others, of course, you know, yeah. those other corporates. And so that that was working really well. But then you know when COVID came, um, Qantas sacked its whole thirty five people in a day. Yeah. And you know, and the same with other corporates. You know, they the first thing they cut at times of trouble is the is the things that are the least tangible. Yeah. So innovation is a, is a pretty un, pretty hard thing to sort of work out what a return on investment might look like. And the return on investment is often further down the track, right? Yes, and yeah. and the duration of the return on investment is the issue. Yeah. So if you've got to protect your budgets or you've got to protect your P and L or, or whatever the case might be, then those things are the first things to get cut. And so we actually kind of parked Slingshot and and. Um, and before we did that, though, we were, we were talking about this concept of creating the melt. And primarily that, primarily that was because we were seeing more and more hardware startups in those application processes for those corporates. And by hardware, I mean making devices, people trying to build, you know, products. And we were fascinated by it, but the problem for us was the technical risk. We're very good at the commercial risk. You know, we understand understand how to run businesses and we understand what's required to be a successful business but we didn't know how to make make these bits yeah and so we had to think differently about it so in consultation with an engineering firm and and with uh dantia which is the sort of the the private arm of um economic development arm of lake macquarie city council we built our first prototyping lab at, at Warners Bay. Yeah. And it was Australia's first combined sort of co-working, prototyping hub and accelerator sort of program provider. And that's been really successful. It was opened by Malcolm Turnbull in 2019. Um, I think I was at that event. Yeah, there was yeah. quite quite a few people there. Yeah. And it attracted quite a lot of media because um, Malcolm Turnbull was – was quite controversial at that time. He he just released a book uh, about about his time in politics, and he and he went on a bit of a rampage. And yeah. so there was a lot of media there, and and that was good for us, of course. And um and you know the success was re was really high. But the the reason why Malcolm Turnbull came was because we got a small grant, five hundred thousand dollars over two years, to help us with the establishment under an agenda for innovation that he created. Uh, and so it was called the New and Existing Incubator uh, Support Grant. And so he came and he was glowing in his praise for what what we were about and, and the tangibility of what he could see. He actually said it was the best use of funds that he'd ever seen in his time in government. Oh, and wow. so he was really thrilled about about the fact that it was his yeah. scheme and that it was and it was, you know, had such potential to be to be doing such great things. And so within that first couple of years, um, we accelerated about a dozen companies. Um, in addition to the money that, that we'd invested into them, they, they'd raised $10, $20 million, employed about 80 people. And so, you know, we got a pretty good roll on pretty quickly. Yeah. And that sort of drew the attention then of, of the Musselbrookshire Council who have this amazing leadership and vision for what happens in the diversification of the upper hunter. And they've got government funding to build this amazing f facility called the Donald Horn building. And so the melt mod manufacturing center is one of the, one of the key components within that building. So we've expanded, expanded the, you know, the network of the melts and the intent is always has always been and is and is still the case to expand the the the, the opportunity for us to create these melt buildings um, in different verticals though, not not copy paste. Yeah, we want to have different prototyping equipment. We want to have different skill sets and capabilities so that we can cross pollinate sort of any industry from any location. With hardware being the commonality across all of them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think that's the biggest, from my perspective as well, it's the biggest differentiator. I think Australia has a reasonably decent VC mm. startup incubator scene in around mm. software. I don't think, um, yeah, it's obviously pittance compared to the US or somewhere else, but mm. and we've gone through a challenge the last two years in particular. Mm. Um, 
but the the focus on hardware i think that's always been a real challenge and it probably comes with the cost associated with hardware as well and then as you said you know that skill sets and everything that goes in a hardware startup being very different to software right yeah it, and it is and you know so we've got this this uh, venture fund um, called melt ventures it's yeah. an early stage venture capital limited partnership yeah. fund which has very specific tax treatments i know that's a mouthful to say but the government created it to basically help attract high net worths and, and other um, angel investors to invest into the more risky startup scene yeah you know, they didn't want to fund that all themselves and the reason why it's so important is because small business in australia employs two out of three people and so the government knows very well that the more businesses we create and, and foster the more people will have jobs yeah and so they created this this uh, esvclp with a 10 percent tax offset up to and capital gains tax free for any profits which is the only scheme i think uh, that offers such favourable tax conditions. Yeah. And so the, the thing about these is there's about 106, um, but 103 of them are just pure software plays. Yeah. Now, with the sort of onset of the, of the sovereign manufacturing stuff that we're hearing on the back of COVID and with also the, uh, the, the clean climate tech solution space sort of burgeoning, there's a lot more interest now around the hardware space because everybody knows that software will only get you so far. You know, it's great for managing, manipulating, analyzing and reporting, but it's the, it's the physical devices that are actually going to help with those, um, with the, with the, the transition to, to the new economy. Yeah. So, you know, we started thinking about this quite some time ago, 2017, before it was, before it was fashionable yeah um you know we opened that that first melt in december 2019 and then two months later you know COVID hits so we look like geniuses in the sense that you know we'd preempted the sovereign manufacturing risk yeah. that australia had been <clears throat> exposing itself to by essentially killing our manufacturing industries you know in newcastle here we, we've seen a lot of it yeah. the place is amazing don't don't get me wrong but uh, you know, the loss of BHP and everybody thought it was going to be doom and gloom and how would we ever recover? Correct. Um, you know, Geelong and places like that with the car manufacturing industry and all the thousands of businesses that were supporting those industries. So, you know, COVID really sort of fast-tracked the way that people think about business and about opportunity. Um, change was forced upon us and, and humans don't very much like change. I think, it, yeah, forced upon and fast-tracked, fast-tracked everything. Like the, the remote work side of things, I think, you know, we would have got to somewhere, some form of hybrid in the future. I think it fast-tracked it by 10 years. Well, I think 10 years. Yeah. 10 years is a good number. Yeah. We, we saw, you know, in, in, on the slingshot side of things, we saw companies, you know, we were doing an accelerated program for a, for a bank and we couldn't even use Excel, we couldn't use Slack, we couldn't use any of these things because they, because the corporate IT viewed them as a security risk. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Everyone's COVID happens them. and there's 600 people that can't go into their office to run the bank. Suddenly, you know, within a week, all they're all it. working from home on their own laptops and their own computers and they're all patched in via VPNs, etc. Yeah. Um, and they were never going to do that, you know. Not no. not ever in their history would they would they have done that except for the COVID pandemic yeah. forcing them to have to stay home. Yeah. That mm. bank would have died. You know, it, was, it wasn't a tier one bank, but it's a it's bank nonetheless. Yeah, so I think, the, you know, the opportunities that change creates – I think a lot of people are yet to realise, um, and I'm not just talking about the obvious in, in climate change, but change in general. Um, humans humans don't don't like change very much unless it's been forced on them or unless they've got time to sort of digest it. And so that that's really important in terms of what we're seeing now with transition, particularly around energy and advanced manufacturing and all of those all those things that Australia has traditionally got a really high skill set and skill base in um, but we do need to update those skills and we do need to 
to onboard that knowledge and we do need the government to be the catalyst for change when it comes to policy development and all those things uh, to give businesses confidence to be able to invest into those sectors and really help them to to make us, Australia I mean, um, a, you know, a global sort of champion of, of the cause. Because if we wait too long, we'll never catch any of the other nations that are already, you know, quite down quite a way down this path yeah mm. no, i think it yeah you should bang on there and i think there's a good opportunity for australia and then closer to us for the hunter as well or just mm. leaning into our strengths all right like from an energy perspective australia is always you know always a very big player from that side of things and then mm. obviously from the hunter perspective leaning into fa- manufacturing leaning into hardware it, we've got massive advantages here in the hunter that other places don't have and us leaning into that is a very real possibility and r- real advantage that we have. I don't think the Hunter in Newcastle is ever going to be the SAS capital of Australia or the world, right? But from manufacturing and leaning into our opportunities that we have locally, it's mm. going to be really oh, advantageous. Yeah, and, and the thing about the Hunter is that there's so much skill and capability. So, you know, as as coal, and I'm not going to say that there's a, there's a cliff coming for coal, but it's going to transition over the course of time. But also a lot of the companies that invest in coal are also the biggest players in green and clean tech as well, right? As, they are, yeah. So and there's a, a lot of mining companies also that, yeah. are, that are transitioning to becoming renewables companies. And they're some of the biggest investors in this. So it's they not are. a, you know, a mm. yin and yang. Is quite often a lot of the big money that's coming into this is actually coming from the, the players in the mining space, which is really interesting and I think... Uh, again, the hunter's very close to that. Yeah, so, you know, tapping into that skill and capability is something that's really unique to the hunter. You know, we've always been seen as being a, a heartland of energy production. That's undoubted. You know, yeah. we produce most of New South Wales's energy in from this from this region. And so the economy that that, that is New South Wales, we're about 10% of the GDP. $70 billion a year is contributed from the hunter. Yeah. You know, it's way above our weight in terms of, you know, pop population base. Yeah. And in order to protect that, that prosperity, we need to be really seriously thinking about what's coming in the pipe and be preparing for it because those jobs that are in mining that, you know, that will be replaced over the course of time, they're prosperous jobs. They're high-paying jobs and there's a lot of them. And so we need to foster the next opportunities for those people to be able to work in the next generation of industry that comes. Yeah. And, and so part of what the MELT's trying to do is attract the next generation of startups and scale-ups to come here and to set up here and to employ locals because we want thousands of people to be employed in these new economies. Mm. I feel the next generation of the people that are considering are a bit younger and the new and I, let's call it, um, <laughs> that are considering, hey, where I might be working in 10 years' time, 20 years' time. As you said, like, it's not all, often a, you know, a straight line. Are there skill sets in particular that you think people should start to be focusing on as these, you know, jobs of the future start to arise, and especially in and around the companies that you're working with out of the melt? Yeah, look, I, th- I think uh, I think skill sets is something separate, but before I sort of dive into that, I think, the key characteristics are being curious and being resilient. I like this. You know, because if you've got those two things, you know, I, I guess I'm a pretty good case in point there. Oh, I was about I, to dig I've, in that I've as always, well. I've yeah. always been curious and resilient, right? So I've kind of just gone from one opportunity to the next as they present. I've never been frightened about taking an opportunity. I've thought deeply about, you know, how might that fit with me personally? But I, if I'm excited by something, then I, I, I'm on. I'm on. Yeah. So if we reverse that back in your career, right? You mentioned earlier that you did a surveying degree, and the best part about that was it opened up opportunities for you, right? Yeah. And I think again, it's the same with the, the skills of tomorrow. Mm. Um, looking at curiosity, problem solving, resilience. If you have a look at those core skills, they're mm. going to be transferable. Technology is continue to change and evolve, and you know what's relevant today might not be relevant in five years' time. Might not be relevant in five months' time. But if those problem solving, communication, mm. curiosity skills will continue to sort of um, be valuable for forever. But from a degree perspective, if you're looking at surveying for you was that, would you recommend to people to, to look at university or you look at a degree to to open up opportunities for the future? Is it just, is it learning to problem solve through university? Um, yeah, can you get look, your opinion? It's, I, I guess 
I, I probably can't really 100% answer that because I'm biased by the university system. Yeah. You know, by my pathway. And, and so I would, I would personally recommend that. But I can tell you it's not the only way. Yeah. You know, we get a lot of founders that come through programs that have been tradies that have come through working since they were 16, 17. And they've, they've observed through their working practices opportunities to solve problems yeah and some of those guys and girls are great founders yeah but they 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 don't know anything about running businesses but it hasn't stopped them becoming great great founders yeah nor has having a certificate from a university prevented them from doing that either yeah so i wouldn't say that you know you have yet to be successful you have to go to university not in any stretch and in fact some of some of my closest mates that didn't go to uni have got more money than the rest of us put together yeah um, because they they got into trades, they become the best at their trade. You know, they established amazing businesses, and they're employing a lot of people. Yeah. So, y y you, I guess that's why I've sort of avoided the skills question and said go back to go back to curiosity and resilience. Because if you do that, they'll set you up, irrespective of which pathway, whether you take an academic pathway or whether you take a you know a, a physical trades kind of pathway. I think the opportunities are equally high. It, it comes down to your willingness and your desire to be able to make success of whatever path you choose. No, I like it. I like yeah. it. I think one of the more common answers, oh, not common answer, but one of the my f more favorable answers in around university degrees for people is not necessarily what they learned, but learning how to learn mm. or learning how to research, learning how to communicate a problem and problem solve. So you set a problem and how to actually, A, solve the problem and then communicate that. Mm. And that's what some people learn through university. And that's yeah. the skill that is probably is. most beneficial as you take that into the real world. Yeah, and I think you 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 gain through university a level of independence. Yeah, you know because no one holds your hand when you're learning. Nobody forces you to turn up to any lessons or any tutorials. You know it's entirely up to you. You don't have to be there. And so if you if you don't have the attitude of I want to be successful, you'll fail. Yeah, and and. You know, so that's that kind of re the element of resilience in the in the independence that I that I mentioned. But it's certainly it's certainly not a recipe for success. No. Signing up to a, to any to any course, um, I was fortunate because the the surveying degree is part of the engineering faculty, and so you really are a problem solver. Yeah. You know, you, you learn how to solve problems, and you learn how to how to be mechanical about about things. Um, I'm pretty diligent. I'm a bit of a numbers nerd probably why i'm a, why i'm coo yeah. i'm sure i drive people crazy because i'm a bit anal with things yeah but i don't miss too much either yeah um i've got an eye for detail mm. i think that engineering it's a uh it's a mindset as well but i think that engineering space is well and continue to grow in the hunter i think mm. it's going to be you know, really a core of what we do in the future and hopefully just a big stake in the ground for you know the greater hunter region on you know continuing to grow and thrive in that area and melt big part of you know building some companies or helping grow and foster and build companies locally then as you said hire more people mm. uh, locally yeah and it, it, look at the end of the day there's there's so much capability as i said before that that this generation you know our, our generation my generation I'm, I'm a fair bit older than you i've just found out <laughs> but what we want to do or what i want to do in the next 10 years is, is leave a bit of a legacy you know, because that'll sort of see me out, you know, in a lot of ways in terms of the sort of the face-to-face. -face. You don't want those skills, and there's a lot of people in my, my age group, you don't want to leave those skills, you know, in the ether. You don't want to take them to your grades, grave. So yeah. you want to be investing that back into, into the next generation and helping them with opportunities that don't exist right now. Yeah, no, I like you it. Know, the, the, future, the future of jobs and the future of work, we really don't know what that's going to be in in a couple of decades time with AI and robotics and automation and all those things. So yeah. the curiosity and the resilience, yeah. they're, they're going to really, they're going to really bubble to the surface. No, I like it. Um, obviously skills will change. I think the technologies will change, but from the melts perspective, is there a vision for what five, 10, 20 years looks like? Is there, you know, this is what a perfect world, this is what a success would look like. Yeah, so for us, obviously, everything starts with investment. Yep. You know, so so the Melt Ventures funds, we want to keep 
sort of rolling those those funds. Um, the, the the very first one, it's still open. Um, you know, we're pushing towards twenty million dollars. That's our that's our sort of target. It's at about twelve thirteen at the moment. Um, but then what we want to do is is keep those those fundraising opportunities going so that we can we can look to invest into the next generations for you know decades to come. Uh, with all all these venture capital funds, they can take you know, various amounts of time to 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 bring back to the investors. I think all the investors know that, but um, our idea is that you know without without funding those businesses, the difficulties that they'll face might be insurmountable. Especially in hardware, right? And that's the biggest difference in software. Like, yeah. I think you can piece together an MVP from a software perspective very cheap these days. There's so many great tools out there. Yeah, even Hard- without software coders. Yeah, you know, you can no code tools. No, yeah, no codes. No code. You know, it's changing, changing that. But yeah, but yeah, and hardware's a different. Like, you know, you might be able to piece together an MVP of something. Uh, very small but you know i think some of the companies you're working with you know mm-hmm. you're requiring significant investment up front right yeah i mean even to build a frankenstein you know works like looks like is is still a challenge yeah. you know if you think about what it takes to be successful in business it, it's quite often a lot of a lot of skills that are outside of your normal sort of range of capability so what the melt does is wraps around with us as people kind of an executive team and so we help those those founders fill the gaps Beautiful. of their knowledge skills and, and capabilities to be able to at least think about running a business and then it gives them the opportunity as they grow and build their own skills to be able to then take over that sort of that full function and employ other people in the exec team and and employees and then build out their business. Um, and so that that sort of incubation that the Melt does is really important in the early stage. And, it, and it's why we sort of focus on a, on, a, on a smaller group of companies. You know, our success metrics are really good. That's because we, we, we're very particular about who we invest into and therefore who we spend our time with. Yeah. On yeah. that note then, so if uh, – who. What's it look like for a company or somebody out there with an idea or something they might have, let's call it an idea or something a bit further along the line. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's that process look like if somebody's sitting out there at the moment um, in around that manufacturing space or hardware space and they're, they're thinking, I've got something, or I've been playing around with an idea. What does that journey from there to joining the Melt look like? Yeah, so uh, there's a couple of web- websites. So we've got the Melt accelerator website it's just the melt.io and then we've got the melt ventures melt.ventures um website so go to either one of those websites and the links are there you know to be able to get in contact with us please reach out to us no you know don't underestimate the quality of your idea and 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 the interest that we might have in it and you know what we do then is ask for a for a for a pitch kind of deck, yep. um, that gives us sort of the, the very fairly early first look at what the technology or what the idea might be. And then we open it up with conversation yep. and, and really just then start to dig a bit deeper. And then, you know, if that's looking good at that point, then we go through a DD process and, and it just rolls from there. Yeah. So, I like your, uh, I like um, the point about, you know, ask questions because i know in previously in slingshot you've you know some of the companies and more successful companies that you've you've taken on as well Mm -hmm. have been nothing more than a pitch deck or a couple of slides with an idea like they hadn't had anything built but they had a a good idea for a a very real problem to be solved yeah um and they've rolled right through and i'm sure you've had people significantly further down the track um both get in and out so it's just the idea and the team is that the, yeah? The that's two, that's two? that's true. Um, you know, we we take on startups and scale ups. We don't just invest into into straight ideation kind yeah. of you know, early early stage. Yeah. Um, when I say scale ups, you know, it's, there's always conjecture as to what what it means to be a, a startup versus scale up. But our investment thesis is up to um, Series A. So seed. Pre-seed, seed, Series A is sort of our sweet spot. Yep. And one of the reasons for that is because those other VCs, the 103, quite often a lot of them are, you know, are far bigger. Yep. Uh, and the ones, the one, the other couple that are dabbling in, in hardware, 
you know, they're, they're, they're taking bets at, that start at five or 10 or 20 million, not, yeah. not at 50 grand to a million, yeah. you know? And so that's why I say, don't, don't hold back. If you're making something and you, and, and you want to pitch, pitch it to us, please do. Um, because we're interested in seeing what's out there and, and maybe even the best advice we can give is stop. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, and, and without sounding like we're ruthless about that, cause we're not, sometimes people just need to know, yeah. you know, is this a passion project or is this really likely to turn into something that's going to feed me long yeah. term? And it's just experience. You've seen so many of them come through that somebody mm. might have an idea similar to something else you've seen fail and you know the reason that it has failed or it won't ever come to fruition and being able to give that advice just through experience and what you've seen, right? Yeah, I mean, we see hundreds hundreds of, of ideas. Um, there's a bit of a common common analogy that for every thing that somebody's working on, there's a hundred other people in the world that are also yeah. working on it. And so it becomes a speed to market thing. So, you know, if you're dilly dallying, thinking about this thing and wondering how you're going to make it happen and who's going to help you to do it, you know, that's probably not going to get you, you know, success, but we can tell you that. And, and we can also give you the encouragement and the advice to be able to help it along its way if if all of that, um, all the attributes are right. On that, that success part, um, are there some common attributes that you've seen with all the companies you've worked with, you know, whether it be that way back from the slingshot right through the melt right these days? Um, I'm sure there's got to be some commonalities in the successful founders that you've seen. Is there common personality traits or, or things that people should be looking at learning that you think, hey, these are the, if you can nail these two or three things, uh, whether they've got it um, themselves or they've had to learn these, because mm -hmm. there are there some things that people should be really focusing on? Yes, there are. Uh, we, we actually probably back the founders more than we back the ideas. Yeah. Um, and that's probably not news to anybody. No. But the, the thing about that is that the passion and the desire and the resolve for the for the people that are behind these businesses to make them successful is what you're looking for. So they're the key things. It might not necessarily be that you've got the most skill or the most knowledge around that thing. It's it's uh, can you bring that thing to market? Okay. And have you got the 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 ability to be able to or the desire or the passion to be able to drive it um, long term? Yeah. And and a lot of people don't, you know, they think it's a great idea. They think they're going to sell it, you know, in a year's time to somebody for millions yeah. and their job's done. But that's not how, that's not the reality of how this works. And, um, and so the best founders are the ones that you know, you can, that you can work with as an investor that are coachable, that, uh, that, that are willing to listen, um, you know, because they're coming to us for that purpose they're yeah. coming to us for the decades of experience that we've got in this space but if they're coming to you with a closed mind about you know learning or about being mentored or being coached and taking advice then you know it's unlikely that we're we're, we're gonna, or it's gonna make an out. investment or that we're going to be able to to work with those people um we don't we don't want to be seen that what I've just said is the is you know that we're dominating or we're domineering of of that, but but, but well, there's experience there to be leveraged, right? And but we not... want to be on the journey. Is is the point? You know, being on the journey with them, not not uh, you know sitting completely external. Yeah, not just in putting money in and then stepping away. That's that's not what the melt's about. No, and I think that's the point of difference, right? It's both the opportunity for investment, but also the the experience and um, experience that you can leverage in helping you know surround yourself, as you mentioned, wrap your team around mm -hmm. um, to get them to that next stage before they can so build or hire those skills internally. Yeah, it's definitely a big difference. You know, there's a lot of accelerators, and and you know, out of the slingshot success, that created a bit of a problem in itself because accelerators started popping up like there was no tomorrow prior to COVID. Yeah. And, you know, the quality of them, many of them, not all of them, was pretty poor. Quite often you had people delivering mentoring, coaching sessions that had never run a business. Yeah. 
that just baffles me. How 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 could those people be giving advice to the next generation of company founders trying to build businesses when you've never run one yourself? Um, and so, what we do differently is because we evolve all the time, and Slingshot evolved year on year, program on program. No two programs were ever the same. And part of the reason for that is because generationally things change, technology changes. You know, philosophies change, methodologies change. And so the thing about the melt is that we don't stand at the front of a classroom and deliver, you know, content to to a cohort for 12 weeks. We don't do that. We did that with Slingshot for a, for a time, but we don't do that anymore because we know that that's in hardware, that's not how you do it. Yep. That's not going to get you the success. Those startups will fail. Um, because the depth of what they require is far deeper than, you know, pitch coaching and lean canvas and how to market 101 and all that stuff. Yeah. They're trying to build physical products, build prototypes and and cobble together information, knowledge that they have absolutely zero clue about. Yeah. So what we do is we bring in that that tailored support for each and every one because they're all different. They're all at different stages of their growth. They're all, all the founders have different knowledge, skill sets. So we, we bring in the preferred suppliers, our preferred suppliers, you know, that offer the services and, and, you know, are specialists in the startup space. People we trust, some of them are investors in our fund. And that gives us that sort of skin in the game element that other accelerators just don't have. Yeah. We put our money in these companies. We're putting our time and effort into these companies forever, not just for 12 weeks. Yeah. Mm. I, I like it as it's a def, different you know point of view. Obviously, it's that vested interest, right? Mm. Um, we touch on obviously the company side of things. Um, if people like what they hear or are interested in what they hear from the investment side of things, um, how do they get in touch? What does that process look like? You mentioned the fund's still open, twelve ish, thirteen mil at the moment, looking for twenty. Um, what does it look like from an investment perspective? Yeah, so it's pretty similar to that to the process that I described before. Yeah, um, you know, you apply online. Yeah. Or personally, you know, if you know us and and or you know someone that knows us, have them make a warm introduction. Yeah, and um, and then we'll just go through that that sort of pitch, um, and then formal sort of formal chat. Yeah, uh, and then if it if it looks like it's it's. Uh, got legs, then we'll we'll go through a DD process. Yep, and the investment thesis or the, the the upsell from that side for the mill. It's really hardware focused. Looking at that longer game, obviously trying to build locally here in the hunter to start with, and then see where that grows. Yep, yep. So the core thesis is uh, advanced manufacturing or modern manufacturing. How, how you know, yep. however you want to spin that climate and clean tech sort of solutions. That's our sort of bigger focus. Um, anything that's, that's got a typical, you know, embedded IoT element, which could be, you know, ag tech and other things, yep. med tech even. Um, we're involved in the, the Health Innovation Living Lab at, at, uh, at the John Hunter Hospital, as an example. Beautiful. And, you know, in the Slingshot days, we ran um, health catalyst HCF Catalyst program for them, yeah. created the brand and ran it for seven years. So a lot of medical um, oh. devices and a lot of founders c came through those programs. That's a big market as well. It's a big market locally. Yeah, it's, a bit, it's, well. it's, it's, it's starting to, to get real traction as well with the work that's going on at the John Hunter. So yeah. we're thrilled to be, to be involved in that. Um, it's hard though. Med MedTech's hard because, you know, the TGA and, and compliance and regulation is, is far tougher. Um, but again, you know, if you've got a good idea and you think you can make it happen, then let us know about it. I like it. I like it. Um, and we're probably getting close to the end of our time. If we had a look at um, somebody's looked at your career, uh, you obviously you've started, you've looked at surveying, and then we ended up in a COO, but you're working with a lot of companies at the moment. You're seeing companies from idea stage through to uh, listing stages with some of the companies that you've worked with. I mean, is there any starting points or any points that, or the best book you've read or bit books you've read, authors, people that you'd point people in the direction of like, hey, this is a book that one of your favorite books or, or, or a podcast or something that you think, uh, hey, this would be must read for anyone? Well, rather than reading a book, I'd say come and talk to us. Yeah. You know, pop in, pop in and have a chat to us. Yeah. 
you know, there's nothing better than that sort of personal connection, I reckon. Yeah. Um, you know, you can read books and you can digest content online. There's copious amounts of it there. Yeah. Uh, and so some of it is not correct. Yeah. Some of it is, you know, I wouldn't agree with. Some of it I wouldn't recommend. Yeah. Because everything is horses for courses. Yeah. And so come, just come and talk to us. Come, yeah, I like the Engage in a conversation so. and, and we'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll tell you what we think. Yeah. I like the doing side of it. And I think what you mentioned before around, uh, you know, you can go a academic route, but also you can, you can come from a trades route. Like you're actually in there, hands on the tools or Absolutely. actually doing something yeah. and looking at the, the actual doing as opposed to the consuming of content. I, I really like that angle. And it's the same too with, you know, with the next generation of students coming through. Yeah. You know, there's pathways now for you to do stuff. Yeah. You know, the, the Musselbrook um, Donald Horn building has a STEM innovation lab on the top level. Yeah. And, and that's, although that's focused around the diversification of the economy up there, it's providing amazing opportunity for kids to be able to think about STEM pathways and about entrepreneurship and innovation when otherwise it would be just this mystical thing. Oh, I love it. I like, from a, a more a digital technology perspective, like any advice I'd always give to, if it was a software developer, it'd be build a website or build an application. If it was mm. a UX designer, it'd build a portfolio. For Looking at somewhere from that hardware is like, get your hands dirty is what I'm yeah, hearing. Come, it's, it's, come in and do it. Come yeah. in and do. Which is why, you know, I said in my response to your previous question yeah. about reading stuff online and yeah. content, immerse yourself. Yeah. Come and engage and, Im and immerse yourself in the opportunity. See it for yourself. Yep. Test it. See if it, see if you think it might work for you. Come and have a look at the space. And even have a look at the equipment. See if see if we can help you to build your prototypes, or or ask us. Be honest and tell us what it is that you want. And if it's not somebody with their own idea, but somebody wants to get in and around those tools, I think you know if you were yeah. to be seeing those people with that skill sets, there's a fair chance you'll know a company that will be looking for that skill set over time, right? Absolutely. And you know, a lot of these startup companies, they. They're looking for bright, young, new talent yeah. um, that can help them on the journey. And, you know, if you get in at the right stage in a startup and you get some equity, yeah, you might not be earning much. Yeah. But, you know, what yeah. the equity might be worth at some point in time yeah. could dwarf any amount of money that you're ever likely to make any other way. Yeah, I like it. It's that, uh, you yeah. know, going in, open eyes. Um, I like it. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Mate. I think that's some really good takeaways, especially for some people younger in their career, you know, how they might be able to tackle it. Um, and also just some really good insights in what's happening in the melt, um, what's happening for the Greater Hunter region. So I appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. Cheers.